Good afternoon and welcome to the final session of our full money webinar series by the Institute of International Monetary Research in collaboration with the Vincent Center at the University of Buckingham. I'm Dr. Juan Castaneda, Director of the IMR, and today I will be hosting Diego Zuluaga, who is Associate Director of Financial Regulation Studies at the Cato Institute Center for Monetary and Financial Alternatives, where he covers financial technology and consumer credit. He's the author of Should Cryptocurrencies Be Regulated Like Securities? and the Community Reinvestment Act in the age of fintech and bank competition. He has previously testified on the impact of restrictions on short-term lending before the House Subcommittee on Consumer Protection and Financial Institutions. Before joining Cato, Diego was Head of Financial Services and Tech Policy at the Institute of Economic Affairs in London, where he wrote on a range of financial regulatory issues, such as the social value of finance, the taxation of capital income, and the importance of free capital mobility around the world. Diego is also a member of the IMR's Academic Advisory Council. Diego Zulua will discuss today new methods of payment and the policy implications, after which we will allow time for Q&A with viewers at home. Today's presentation and the Q&A session will be recorded, but we'll only make his presentation available on our YouTube channel in the next few days. You can go uh, online to our website, www.mv-pt.org, to access this presentation and other webinars in our series. Questions must be submitted via the chat option on Teams, and I will moderate them and address the speaker. We may not have time to address all questions submitted, so if your question doesn't get answered, please email us on enquiries at mv-pt.org and we'll pass your questions on to our speaker. This is the final session of our money webinar series in the summer term, which will continue in the autumn with another series on money and central banking. In addition, we'll have another series on the evolution of central banks and the roles in a financial crisis in September and October by professors Charles Goulart and Forrest Cappy. You will find more information on the Institute's website and uh, forthcoming events. So thank you very much, uh, Diego, for accepting our invitation. It is a pleasure to have you with us on board in this series. And again, thank you very much. The floor is entirely yours. Thank you, Juan. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you this afternoon and uh, to address the IAMR and its distinguished audience. I've been a fan of yours since the Institute was set up, and I'm very glad to uh, be able to be a presenter at, at one of your sessions, even if it's in August. I guess it takes a Spaniard to make another Spaniard work in August, but I won't hold a grudge against you for it. At any rate, it's a topic that's very dear to my heart, and therefore, even uh, at times of leisure, I'm very happy uh, to address it, which is the rise of new forms of payment and their implications for policy and regulation. Obviously, payments have changed very significantly on the private sector side, particularly over the last 10 or 15 years. And the main driver of that change has been the rise of the Internet and the spread of mobile technology and particularly smartphone technology. And by now, what we have is a wide variety of different products and technologies. Um, and in addition to that, we have central banks increasingly interested in taking part in payments innovation. They have been in some countries, notably the United States, lagging in speeding up payments, certainly keeping it up with the technology. In other countries, they've been perhaps keeping up with it more, but they're certainly looking to expand their role. And the Bank of England, uh, with which uh, a lot of your audience is extremely familiar, of course, uh, issued a discussion paper in March that is very relevant to its role in payments and potentially also its future role even in providing banking services, which I will discuss later. But what I would like to do in this presentation is to begin by classifying some of the different payments innovations that have recently happened, particularly the most successful ones, the ones that have experienced a great deal of take up and the ones that have caused um, regula regulatory controversy or uh, attention grabbing uh, headlines from different venues. I will address those and put them into the different categories as I see them. I will then go over the reasons why they are so significant, their market value, but also their um, regulatory, the, the ways in which they may challenge or address policy and 
more widely within those policy implications, I will then uh, focus on the specifics of faster payments and particularly cryptocurrencies, digital currencies by private actors, and then finally central bank digital currencies, because those are the closest uh, or at least are believed to be uh, affect, to affect monetary policy more closely. So if we move on to the next slide, what you see is some of the key brands that you may have seen in headlines that have taken up a lot of the payments market globally and notably there are very different categories so you see libra which was a facebook led payments innovation a consortium that is aiming to produce a digital currency for global payments uh, in the middle there is the logo for bitcoin which since 2008 has at least according to some people completely revolutionized peer-to-peer -peer payments uh, and PayPal, of course, which rose as a way to pay for things on the internet, and it was long associated with eBay and various others, which I will discuss in due course. The next slide gives you a sense, particularly with a focus in the US market, of how enormously significant some of these innovations have been. This is the growth in the payments volume quarter by quarter of Venmo. Venmo, for those who don't know, is an application that is active in the United States uh, for payment via smartphones, peer-to-peer -peer payments via smartphones. Um, no longer do users need to go through even PayPal or their bank accounts to settle payments with each other. For example, when they split the bill for a restaurant, they can now do it directly on their smartphones. And this has proved extremely popular with particularly younger audiences. And this gives you a sense of the exponential growth that it's experienced. The next slide goes into developing markets. And of course, many of these didn't have a highly developed electronic payments network before the mid 2000s. And so what you see in Africa, but also and particularly notably in China, is that private providers have leapfrogged the payment card system and the bank intermediated payment system to some extent. And it's mobile technology that has actually increased financial inclusion by allowing a lot of people to hold cheap mobile money accounts. If we move to the next slide, what we see is a classification of the different payments innovations that since the late 1990s have really transformed peer-to-peer -peer payments. The first category I would highlight are non-bank payment service providers and names that are famous there are PayPal, Venmo, which I mentioned, and Zelle, which in the US is a network of banks that uh, is, you know, does quick payments within that particular network. Um, those particularly arose from the late 1990s, but they grew in the mid 2000s with the growth of the internet. In late 2008, a paper came out called Bitcoin, a peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash system, which addressed something that actually Milton Friedman, one of the uh, intellectual leaders I know um, of the IIMR and one whom I admire myself, um, had anticipated in 1999. He'd said that what was missing from the internet, which he saw as a force not only for innovation and economic growth, but also for freedom, he said that what was missing was a reliable e-cash, a way for A to pay B without B knowing A or A knowing B. And this paper tried to, tried to develop that notion into something practicable by um, outlining a system in which through software, and the creation of incentives that made people behave in a truthful way, actually such peer-to-peer -peer payments could happen without an intermediary. And that's been revolutionary technically, if not necessarily revolutionize the market because Bitcoin is still a very small fraction of the overall payments market and it's not even a you know, particularly popular uh, payments instrument. It's more of a speculative asset at this stage. But there have been very many other um, Bitcoin imitations or emulations or uh, modifications of that particular idea. So it's been significant in that way. Then there have been innovations focused on foreign exchange. This is a part of the payments market that for reasons of bureaucracy, but also of regulatory barriers are particularly slow and costly. 700 basis points is not an uncommon price. So 7% for an international remittance or international payment to cost and it may take anywhere between four and five or, or even 10 days to settle depending on the country. And so there's been a great incentive to develop innovations in foreign exchange payments. And firms like TransferWise and Revolut, both of which are based in the UK, have been very successful at attracting particularly a, a millennial traveling tourist audience. More recently, and going off the popularity of 
cryptocurrencies, there have been attempts to develop private digital currencies, that is, ones owned by private intermediaries, ones that are intermediated. The most controversial one, although still undeveloped, is the one I mentioned earlier, Libra. And the reason it's controversial is because Facebook has launched it, or Facebook has led it, and Facebook is first of all a very large and successful tech firm, and then secondly, it's considered to be involved in very many sensitive areas from a regulatory perspective. But those have had uh, important implications as well. And then latterly, uh, and perhaps most significantly from a regulatory perspective, are central bank digital currencies, which depending on who uses the term may refer to retail deposit accounts at the central bank, which historically have been uh, the case in some countries, including in, in Spain uh, in the 19th century, you could open a deposit account at the Bank of Spain. But more recently, it's not been something that uh, central banks were involved in at all. So that's one interpretation of them. And there are other interpretations which involve an upgrade of the central bank's technology to make instant payments uh, more widely available and perhaps cheaper and to take advantage of some of the technology that cryptocurrencies use. So, so those are some of the key, I think, classes in recent payments innovation. And in the next slide goes over some of the reasons why they arose. Non-bank payment services clearly arose in conjunction with the rise of internet commerce. It wasn't obvious how one could pay for things on the internet and ensuring trust was very important, but also having software that would make payments go through relatively quickly. And that's how PayPal came about. Indeed, PayPal was associated with eBay, a major auction site and e-commerce site uh, that was one of the big innovators in the first tech boom. The other driver have been smartphones because a lot of the more recent uh, payments innovations uh, in the non-bank area are related to mobile applications, ones in which one may hold a balance. Uh, they're not bank accounts, but that balance may be transferred to other users or even to third parties without an account. And that's the case for apps like Venmo, but also Cash App and many other such applications which offer what are typically called digital wallets. In the case of cryptocurrencies, the fact that Bitcoin was launched in late 2008 already gives a clue. Bitcoin was born of distrust in fiat monies, in, in central banks, and particularly in the context of a financial crisis that to some people at the time seemed bound to be inflationary. It didn't turn out that way for various reasons that I won't go into, but that was certainly a motivating factor for that. Foreign exchange, the high cost is the big driver. And in the case of uh, private digital currencies, but also CBDC, um, the main aim, at least the stated one, is financial inclusion making fast payments more widely available. Um, of course, the sorts of firms offering private digital currencies are sometimes involved in crypto because they know the business already and they want to offer a ladder into which customers, through which customers can get into crypto trading. But in the case of Facebook social media, and as we will see in China, one of the big two payments giants that have emerged recently in mobile payments is also a social media firm called WeChat. Uh, of course, the connection there is obvious, both social media messaging apps and digital wallets, payments firms have network effects, but also oftentimes in social settings, one may want to make payments. And those are relatively small value payments, but they're of very high significance and very frequent. And so there is almost a natural marriage between the two technologies. And then finally, in the case of CBDC, I think part of the reaction is to private competition, to the perception that if central banks don't do something to bring themselves into the, in the by now mid 21st century uh, that they will be left behind and become less relevant. And then in cases such as the Bank of England's, the decline of cash is also raised as an issue. The fact that the central bank issued liability that the public can use, the only one right now, which is cash, is no longer so prevalent. Of course, other people defend CBDCs as a way to better implement monetary policy, and I will get into that later as well. So now let's go into the major policy implications, which are in the next slide. On the left column, I have some of the private sector innovation related policy implications, the ones that I see as addressing policy concerns that have been significant among uh, decision makers, both in, in developed and in developing economies in recent years. And on the right column, you will see the concerns, the parts of policy that I think 
are making policymakers slightly wary of these technologies, but also more interested in getting themselves more directly involved in, involved in their development and their use. So on the private sector side, on the innovation related side, one of the first implications is more competition with banks. Banks for a long time dominated payments. Banks have been in many countries a restricted cartel, whether by restrictions via charters or explicit competition policies that banned um, the entry of new participants. And there's been an interest in many countries to increase competition in banking. In the UK, this has taken the form of an investigation into the market for retail banking, which is dominated by four or five institutions. And there's a concern that people aren't switching enough and reacting enough to price incentives. In the US, it's got much more to do, ironically, with a fragmentation of the banking market. The fact that you have too many competitors and therefore coordination to come up with ways in which payments can be settled more quickly is more difficult to achieve. Uh, and so people are concerned that the slowness of the payment system and the high cost of the payment system relative to other countries is particularly hurting uh, poorer individuals. Related to this, there's the goal of financial inclusion. The UK has almost universal banking in the sense that almost 100% of adults hold a bank account. I think it's more than 99% by now. In the United States, the picture is slightly different. Around 9% of US households don't have a bank account and many more have a basic bank account, but very little else in the way of connections to banking. And so many people see as new payments innovations, particularly those related not to banks, but to other providers, digital wallets, smartphone based apps and so on, as a way to bring people into the mainstream financial system and to, for example, allow them to uh, create, build a credit score. The other big innovation uh, that payments have ushered into is the entry of big tech into finance or the payments often represent the first entry point for big tech into finance that raises concerns among policymakers but it's also potentially very pro-competitive if you think about it the banking sector is increasingly consolidated globally uh, in the uk obviously we mentioned the fact that more than 80 percent of deposits are held by the largest four or five institutions in the us has also been a trend of consolidation concentration is much less but consolidation continues and there's a concern that particularly at the top, there isn't enough of a churn. Now, big tech firms are among the few institutions, the few organizations that can really challenge the dominance of established banks. They have a similar size, but they also have a similar interest in uh, developing large customer bases and they know their customer bases very well and they know their data very well, so they can increase competition in banking. And then cross-border payments, this idea that increasingly people want to operate between countries. This is a big concern in the European Union, always has been with the desire to develop the internal market. And payments here, or payments innovation, can lower the cost, can help to bridge some of the gaps between jurisdictions and can perhaps even hopefully uh, overcome the many linkages that are involved in regular bank intermediated payments. To give you a sense of what international payments traditionally looks like, if you order a payment from one jurisdiction to go into another country, you have to go first of all to, through your bank. If your bank doesn't have a direct connection to the central bank, it may go through a correspondent bank from that to its own central bank, and then from that central bank to the recipient country central bank, thence to the correspondent bank in the recipient country, and finally to the recipient's bank account. Many steps, many different parts that are slower than we would like and then technology allows, and therefore great opportunities for innovation. All of those I think are very promising. There are clearly concerns as well from a policy perspective, certainly among the more mainstream thinking policymakers. The first are prudential concerns. Some of these non-bank payments firms have become very large and not only large, but also they manage growing amounts of customer data. They are cross-border and they host a lot of their information online on the cloud uh, beyond some of the jurisdictions that wish to regulate them. And there's a concern that existing banking regulation may not adequately address some of these regulatory challenges. These innovations also clearly raise um, questions about the role of central banks. Uh, in, in the first place, because central banks see digital payments as at least in part replacing cash, and therefore the one liability they issue no longer being, uh, the, the one liability they issue to the public, that is, 
no longer being directly, uh, no, no longer being so relevant as it was in the past. And they have implications for monetary policy, according to some people. Um, in the case of innovations like Libra, for example, the Libra was initially going to be a hybrid of various different relatively stable fiat currencies from around the world, the dollar, the yen, the euro, and various others. And uh, some people were concerned about the impact that would have on central banks' ability to um, manage monetary policy, but also whether they would have any implications for the banking system. The Libra Association insisted that it wouldn't because for every unit that they issued of this hybrid, they would have an equivalent amount in value of safe assets, so to speak, you know, bank accounts and government bonds backing them. And therefore, there would be no multiplier there and, and, and no, no retrenchment of credit in the event of a run on Libra. And that's a judgment that I tend to sympathize with, but one I'm, I'm very happy to discuss later. And then the other major implication for monetary policy is that some people believe digital payments can help monetary policy. Ken Rogoff, formerly of the IMF and at Harvard, has famously argued that if you remove cash and if you move directly into a world of either central bank retail accounts or retail accounts that are fully digital, that then you could implement negative interest rates more effectively and you would be able to go not just beyond the zero lower bound, but beyond the effective lower bound, which may be negative, that has transpired in recent years with, with the very low, sometimes negative policy rates that various central banks have implemented. So some people see this as an opportunity as well for better central bank policy. What the incentives are that that raises, I, I think, uh, haven't been fully discussed, and they really depend on whether you believe the, um, the central bank is just a benevolent social planner or that they also have bureaucratic incentives to increase their remit and they also have the potential to make mistakes. And then finally, in one implication that I put a question mark on, because I'm not so sure that it is one, is the question of a global reserve currency. An argument that some people make now in the United States especially is that digital payments and the fact that particularly, which I will address in a moment, that China has leapfrogged some of the existing payment networks and uh, payments, pay payment system infrastructure of the West mean that the West and particularly the US could be left behind uh, as far as its uh, currency being globally dominant is concerned. The reason I'm slightly questioning that notion is that I think being a dominant reserve currency is more a question of governance than a question of technology. You have to have you have to be trusted and you have to have a record of relatively stable purchasing power, the rule of law, and for example, free capital mobility. China doesn't have such a record. And I think a lot of people are very skeptical indeed that even with payments innovations, um, holding, making contracts in renminbi could be as advantageous and as reliable as holding them in the US dollar. And therefore, I'm skeptical that technical innovations alone can account for the kind of major policy shift, the major um, tr trend, trend shift in global reserve currencies that some people predict. If we go to the next slide, we see a case study of probably the market where digital payments have developed the most and the fastest. This describes the user base of two digital payments applications, Alipay and WeChat. Alipay is a division of Alibaba, which is the biggest e-commerce firm in the world, but primarily active in China. And WeChat Pay is the payments application of WeChat, which is an immensely popular social media app in China. And uh, both of those have enormous user bases, most of them domestically Chinese, and they have multiplied the customer base of Union Pay, which is the bank uh, intermediated payment network, uh, the card network that existed in China um, before the internet came about. They've become immensely popular to the extent that even um, beggars on the street uh, use WeChat Pay and Alipay to collect what in other places would just be, you know, nickels and dimes. And uh, the, the, the precedent is not only in the trajectory of these digital, digital payments apps, but also in their regulatory treatment. The People's Bank of China initially was very encouraging of these apps and allowed them to grow. 
More recently, it's uh, increased its oversight of them. It says for systemic reasons and to make sure that no money laundering happens. But potentially also there's a concern that these firms are too independent. By contrast with most large Chinese banks, they're not under the direct control of the Chinese state and they hold a lot of customer data that until 2018 they were able to keep almost fully private. Since then, the PBOC has required them to make that information available to itself, but also to other third party payments providers. And clearly there that reduces the competitive edge that these providers had. And um, potentially it also makes it easier for the PBOC to do what it's been trying to do since cryptocurrencies became uh, something that you know came on their radar, which is to develop uh, its own version of digital bank accounts. And again, the motives here, uh, the public ones are about financial inclusion and preventing you know transparency, increasing competition and so forth. There's a concern also about potential surveillance of customers. The Chinese president is not one necessarily that will be fulfilled in other countries because other countries have more checks and balances against these things. But certainly the use of smartphones as the major means of payments is something that every jurisdiction is moving into. And if we go on to the next slide, we really see in China also the kind of the fulfillment of a trend line that I see happening in very many other countries, which is going from internet payments in the kind of world that Milton Friedman predicted, a reliable e-cash that was privately uh, available without involvement either of necessarily of the central bank or of private third parties, to Bitcoin, which is a fulfillment of that ideal, albeit an imperfect one, and now to central bank digital currencies. And that's really in, in the span of 20 years, that's the the way in which the circle has closed and we've moved back to a world in which it seems central banks are going to be playing a very major role. Um, clearly central banks are fighting back against outside competitors and uh, in contrast to what a lot of them will say, their success in remaining relevant has more to do with their own management of monetary policy and their understanding of the boundaries between the private and the public sector than with the success of the competition. And that is because central banks, first of all, have a monopoly, but second of all, they have a very strong starting advantage because of the network effects of payments. And so to conclude and to address myself specifically to some of the arguments that the Bank of England has made regarding its development of a CBDC, I would say that the private sector has delivered a lot of these innovations very effectively over the last 10 years or so, that the decline of cash is by no means assured, and particularly the people that are least excluded, least included rather in the financial system are often older, and therefore ones that couldn't shift from cash to digital payments. And therefore that some of the policy advantages of CBDCs in moving exclusively to them over time, that they may be overstated, and that perhaps it is better to keep the role of the central bank more limited to dealing with financial institutions, perhaps opening up master accounts or reserves accounts, as the Bank of England calls them, to non-bank providers. But otherwise, leaving the private sector to innovate and deal with retail customers because they have a history of doing so very well. So with that one, uh, may I maybe take some questions and I'll very happily address any other issues you would like me to.